Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another great webinar in the Watermark Masterclass series for 2023. For those I've not met, I'm Caroline McAuliffe, a partner in the Watermark Interim Executive Practice, and I'm joined today by all of the interim team to welcome you. Jacinta uh, is online in our Melbourne office, Alex Brown, my colleague in Sydney, is joining us, and Alicia Wilson, our marketing guru, who's always here to help pull all of these wonderful webinars together every six weeks. Thank you for um, organising this, Ali. Look, we've had enjoyed and had the great privilege to be able to host some amazing and well-received web webinars over the last three years, a variety of current and relevant topics. And we thank most sincerely all of the outstanding guest presenters who provided practical and actionable advice. And we thank them all for their wisdom and expertise. And if you've missed any of those webinars, please feel free to watch the recordings that are available on our website. A little housekeeping, and I'm gonna get through this real quick um, before we get started. Today's presentation will run for about 45 to 60 minutes. It's the opportunity to pose questions throughout. So use that chat box. Um, and very specifically, if you've got a question for Natalie or I, please put that in the Q&A box also, um, because sometimes that chat just runs away with us um, and we miss out potentially. Ali's going to be monitoring that box for questions. And if there's any natural breaks in the presentation, she will pose those questions so we can get some interaction ha happening on the webinar. Please make sure that all of your boxes are, uh, are ticked to visible. Uh, to all participants so that everyone can enjoy all of the questions and discussions and you can all interact with one another. Um, and we're very happy to answer as many questions as possible throughout. Um, we might have some time at the end also, but we'll just see how we go. And of course, post the webinar, we can also address questions that we didn't get to. So for today's presentation on the expansive topic of longevity, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Natalie Jan Chatonsky. She is an expert in this field. She's the founder and CEO of Full-Time Lives, and she's the author of the book, The Art of Full-Time Living. Welcome, Natalie. Um, we share a passion with Natalie. We're focused on making a positive difference for people and Natalie specifically for women by working with organizations to ensure midlife and older women, women of color, neurodivergence and disabilities can thrive. She also designs and facilitates workshops and programs for women going through midlife transitions. So this, trans this session with Natalie is long overdue. Um, it's such a huge topic to cover. We can't possibly do it in one session, however, one of the webinar objectives is to motivate you to walk away feeling inspired and motivated to start researching and planning how you will seek out meaningful work to be financially independent and thrive at all stages of life, even when you or your loved ones might face health events or lose some of your physical and or cognitive abilities as you age. So if you can leave us with two or three practical takeaways today, realistic tips and advice that you can apply in your own lives today, then we will have met our objectives. So we'd like to kick things off by finding out where everyone is in the audience right now with their longevity planning. So please, can you complete the poll that you will see up on the screen? Um, this is all about uh, to what extent your current career vision aligns with financial independence, meaningful work and your well-being at all your future stages of life and in the coming decades. So if you wouldn't mind answering that, we'll give it about 30 seconds and then Nat and myself will discuss the results. So Nat, what we've got here in the most part is that 44% people seeing the importance of all three, but struggling to align. 
um, them in a clear plan, um, followed by 30% focuses predominantly on one or two aspects with little consideration. So this couldn't have come at a better time, could it, really? This yeah. Part um, this I'm, webinar. I'm actually not surprised. Um, I guess we all have the best intentions to lead a long, healthy and meaningful life. We all know it's really important. And I guess um, the thing is it's really hard to juggle all of those three things all at the same time. So to have financial independence and balancing that out with meaningful work and then well-being, it's, it's, we all want that from our current lives and our future, but bringing it together so that you can do both, that it's satisfying all those things today mm. and the medium term as well as your future self. It's, it's often that's the hardest thing that people struggle with. So having a clear plan actually rather than responding to opportunities today, I actually really encourage people to think way beyond today, next five, 10 years, and actually think 20, 30 years out and work back. Because if you've got that North Star and a really clear vision and you're really emotionally connected to your future self, then everything aligns, all these three areas of financial independence, meaningful work and well-being, all becomes one clearer path and then you're not necessarily going down different side paths and having to make compromises at any stage. Yeah. And I think we all kind of relied on the fact, you know, traditionally that we've got our super happening and that's in the background, just, you know, working away for us. But the world and has changed significantly, hasn't it? And we now have to think more broadly. We're going to live longer we need to probably work longer. And so it's it's a whole new world um, and super might just not cut it anymore. Absolutely. And, um, and I guess it's the tangible things that we tend to focus on. So it's measurable to see how much money's in the bank or in our super fund. So I, I, my observation of people who come to my workshops and talk about it is often they've prioritised the financial aspects, but they've let other things go by the wayside in terms of, well, they did have a career or jobs that were well paid, but that came at a cost. Yeah. With their health or their relationships. Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess I've heard a lot of the regrets of people who were well beyond my stage in life and just hearing it day after day and in my customer interviews over the years, that's really been something that I've realised, gosh, that's something I need to be thinking about and that has also motivated me to help women in particular who don't necessarily prioritise their well-being and their social connections and connection to community. Yeah, it is a chance now for us to reset, isn't it? And um and, and not find ourselves a, a way down the track in a vulnerable position. It's to yeah. plan now. So I'm just going to move on um, and by way of framing this discussion, a quick recap on some key findings from our interim executive survey this year. And this is a real sit up and pay attention quote, if I ever saw one, um, which we included in our survey. And it's from the World Health Organization who estimate that between 2015 and 2050, the proportion of the world's population that is more than 60 years old will nearly double. So that's a real key insight. Um, we are facing so much change, um, you know, not to mention COVID or pandemic, but now a tight, tight labor market, um, economic headwinds, job churn due to technological advancement, declining population and everyone around the world in many countries are are living longer and and therefore will have to work longer so we asked our participants in our interim survey this year what did they feel was the most important way to have our you know employers and organizations and workplaces wake up 
to the concept of longevity. And in their view, refreshing attraction and retention strategies came out on top. 68% of people thought that would be a good start. Um, you know, the ability for organizations to, to redesign dedicated attraction strategies that were targeting age brackets, probably previously not considered and improving retention by encouraging a loyal workforce to take breaks, perhaps through built-in sabbaticals was one idea. And longevity also has implications for communities and the infrastructure to support them. And it needs to become a priority for all levels of government. And we know there are recent developments in policy making, um, such as extending paid time off for family caregiving, and elder care has come along, along with funding for ret retraining and further education opportunities. This is all on government agendas now. So we're, we've made a start. Um, look, most people's careers are now unlikely to end at the retirement age of 67, and instead more people want or need to work longer to pay for that longer life um, and add to their savings, because one day they won't be able to work. So this means, planning now for a portfolio of work, which may include interim executive, contracting, consulting, part-time, flexible board work, advisory work, board work, uh, or a mix of those. And the slide and image that you can see there is a typical work portfolio that we asked our cohort to let us know how is their portfolio currently made up and that is to scale. So in the most part, interim and consulting is um, the main part of their portfolio in paid work um, and then supplemented by the other others there. Um, and of course, that's just the paid, really paid income generating part of their portfolio. And what we maybe need to think about as well is planning for all of the other parts of our life that we want to include in our plans, such as travel and family time, exercise, hobbies, and passion projects. I think everyone's got a book in them. So um, it's all about how we can have paid work that funds all of that other part that we want to include, um, which rounds out a really healthy mental, physical, and quite importantly, social plan for a longer life. Um, so in our survey, we actually have pulled together a longevity plan, very much aimed at the worker or the in individual, the candidates in our lives. And it just poses some questions there. And you can actually download that longevity plan or questionnaire from our website and we'll give you um, direction to that at the end of the webinar and alongside that you can see another one that we've created that's aimed at organizations who need to adapt their workforce planning to incorporate the theme of longevity and um, adapt to a multi-generational workforce so that's also downloadable from our website there and look, traditionally, we thought about career planning in a very linear or ladder way um, that ends at retirement, hard stop, where that model has long passed its expiration date, we would suggest. Um, and in fact, we've included some work by a futurist by the name of Elatia Abate in our um, report also. She talks about um, a, a mosaic career model um, which kind of takes um, seasoned, experienced people thinking about tapping into their core talents, identifying where they can best meet organisational needs, um, championing alternative um, ways and career pathways. Um, it's very much aligned with our own watermark recommendations for identifying your superpowers. So I would advise you to go and have a look at alatiaabatey.com too. She's got lots of um, great data and research there that you can tap into. Now, I really want to, excited to get to this point here um, and hear from Natalie, who's going to tell us all about her own quest over the last five years to design your purposeful life and 
I'm really interested in, in this, Nat, because it kind of happened by accident, as I understand it for you, embarking on your longevity quest in your late 40s um, and currently where you're at with it and meaning, what does meaningful work, where are you getting it, how your income, you're generating an income from it, um, keeping up your lifelong learning practices and maintaining your well-being. Um, and in fact, I think you said you, you're in better shape and you're earning more money <laughs> since you found this purpose. So um, I'm all ears. I really want to hear about your journey here. Thanks, Caro. It all started about five or six years ago when I was a full-time product manager working in a corporate, was in financial services, and I I thought I was on the career track too. Like I, it was a great job great organization that was doing interesting things in the banking industry and I guess I was the first innovation manager in that organization so I was also bringing design thinking practices and making that organization that was very traditional in disrupting the payments market so on the CV it was was my dream job uh, of making an impact to an industry that was ready and ripe for change. So I did that job for a few years, but there was still something missing. Um, and I guess in the background, when I was carrying out lots of customer interviews with banking staff to understand how did the disruption of digital impact their jobs, what I was discovering in my customer interviews with those banking staff was that they felt really threatened with the change. So even though their jobs would be made easier, more seamless, they didn't have to deal with the, all these ugly green screen computer software, um, they were getting much nicer ways of having to, being able to service their clients and just focus on the human aspect. Uh, I guess there was a lot of nervousness. And so I thought it was really exciting to be bringing all this tech and innovating the way the systems were being built and how customers will be able to do instant payments. But the staff, on the other hand, who were working for these banking organisations were extremely nervous. And so I guess it was the confluence of seeing that at work and also having parallel conversations with my parents, particularly my mum, um, and if we kind of skip ahead to the next couple of slides of my mom was starting to get very nervous about what's dad going to do when he retires. So I would be getting these phone calls from mom at, while I was at work, just just getting a bit all a bit stressed and frustrated. Kind of, um, and I, I guess being the eldest daughter and having a brother who lives overseas I just knew that this was something that would eventually become a much bigger problem in terms of my father being very successful in his career, his job, his identity, community is everything to do with his job all his life. Whereas my mum has led her own separate interests, has her own sets of friends and um, just this nervousness of that massive change to them as a couple. So it just got me thinking in terms of, wow, people who have been leading the same sort of routines and lifestyles and jobs really find it difficult to adjust and just even whether it's going to happen or not, because my dad never talked about retirement. It was more my mum's perception. Well, of course, he's approaching retirement age and everyone like their financial advisors and accountants were asking when are you going to retire? Whereas, but my dad never really said that he was going to, but it was more my mum thinking that there was, because society expected him to retire, that therefore I guess it was just this expectation that he would be then leading a life of leisure at home and expecting um, hot meals every lunchtime when she has gotten used to a lifestyle of doing her own things and socialising with other people and not necessarily wanting him around every day for lunch. Um, and so I guess it was kind of around this time that also I started to see that there was a real need to address 
the gender differences at work because I'd worked in lots of different industries. So if we skip back to the previous slide, um, I was getting more and more involved in looking at some of the women at work initiatives in the company I was working for, as well as in the financial services industry. I've still stayed very involved. So I'm the diversity advisory council chair for FINSIA, the financial services um, association for people working in professional services. So it was doing things like this was a uh, bring your daughter to work day of you know running a workshop, an innovation workshop for the daughters of people who are working in the organisation that's working for at the time. And that just got me more and more, I guess, um, passionate about making a difference. So whilst I may not have necessarily been doing much volunteer work, this was my first foray and realising that I had a voice and I had skills that I could contribute and I really enjoyed that. So I've gotten more and more involved in following that interest and trying to use my transferable skills mm. in being a leader and an advocate for what I really believe in. And over time, I've done more and more of that advocacy work and I guess using my voice and that has taken a lot of self-work to really understand how do I tap into what I feel passionate about and have the confidence to bring that out in a public forum, to run workshops, to speak at conferences about things that I'm really confident and passionate about, but then also um, trying to turn that into a consulting practice as well. So um, whilst there were lots of different things that were going on, um, it was that convergence of different ideas and inspiration from my personal and family life that kind of then led me to do more and more discovery work. Mm. I think you just it described, you know, the career path um, that Elaya Bati is talking about, isn't it? It's about exploring, being curious and thinking about your skills and experience and broadening them in, in different ways and packaging them up in different ways. Yeah, I think the chart that you had earlier on about the portfolio of a interim exec, yeah. I really related to that because I think um, even though it was, yeah, my mid-career, I was really yearning for that balance. So whilst I was in a well-paid, stable corporate role, it was really wanting to make a difference somehow, not just through my professional paid yeah. work, but somehow on a much grander scale because I could see the injustice, but then also understanding the sorts of issues that people faced and worried about on a personal level, just like my mum, and just really thinking, gosh, she wouldn't be the only one. And also, also all the women I spoke to in those banking roles we're always going through change and how can we acknowledge and support people who are going on their various different unique journeys of transition and change when work or firm family circumstances are changing and I guess it was that realization that so much of that happens at midlife and older it becomes really complex for women because there are lots of competing things that then impact our physical and mental well-being and then deprioritizing the social connections which is when you need it the most i have a great question actually for you um from georgia lee in our audience so she attended the chief executive women's summit last week and they shared many important pieces of data about where gender equity is in 23 in australia and one scary statistic was the average age of women's retirement age as 52 one of the reasons for this was menopause, which is an, a, another a huge issue that's, um, uh, you know, raising its head. Um, and the associated health issues that are associated with go women at that age going through menopause, they miss out apparently on around $500,000 worth of salary and wages based on an average wage of $70,000. So, Natalie, what's your views on how we can improve this for women and how can organisations really help with that? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm aware of that ABS stat and, um, and I remember when I was writing my book, 
I, that stat was just astounding. I just thought this cannot be. I, I second guessed myself because I thought, how can that be that Australian women are retiring at the age of 51? But then the more I've dug into it and looked at other research, yeah, it's the combination of 10% of women at that midlife phase who are stopping work because of menopausal symptoms. And, and the other thing that's not spoken about is the caregiving responsibilities. So we know that eight out of 10 adult caregivers, so have people who have uh, elder care or responsibilities for people who are disabled, so not necessarily uh, parents or, or people who have younger dependents, those are often the reasons why people, women in particular, are having to stop work and how the ABS, I guess, calculates it, that, well, they're not mm. actually actively looking for work. Mm. And so, like, organisations need to understand there are a whole lot of other things that are going on that are taboo topics, stigmatised, such as menopause and also having adult caregiving responsibilities which is going to only increase because our parents are living longer but yes. then the there is going to be a period when they're having to rely on others and the healthcare system and aged care system just it hasn't adapted mm. for this phase in life and so the onus is being put on women to have to stop their paid work to do this kind of unpaid work um, yeah. which can also impact women's well-being mental yeah. well-being and also physical and also financial totally yeah look we're going to move on now to um your learnings that you um have gained from visiting the blue zones so the blue zones um if you can explain to everyone what they are um i think there is importance here in terms very much so in this social connections that we make in our communities. And um, I think you visited Okinawa in Japan and Loma Linda in the US, where people seem to be leading longer, healthier and happier lives. So what's the key ingredients? What is it that we need to all be doing and learn from them in these communities? So, yeah, the blue zones are fascinating. And in fact, there's a Dan Butner who really put it into the vernacular of the longevity economy, started to do this research more than 20 years ago, really highlighting these five communities around the world where people live longer, healthier, happier lives. So I was really curious after reading his books to get on the ground and go and explore for myself and actually chat with people in those communities and learn see what we could take away in Australia to figure out how we can lead healthy lives as well as build those intergenerational communities. Mm -hmm. So um, Okinawa was the first blue zone that I visited. So that's one of the most southern islands in Japan. And I've lived in Japan. When I was younger, I was an exchange student. And I definitely found the attitudes of people who live in Okinawa is very different from the rest of Japan. In fact, the life expectancy of people who live in Okinawa are well beyond 110. So it's not uncommon for people to live to 120 and still be quite relatively active and social and really engaged and great to chat with. And I really enjoyed meeting people there because they were so inspiring and so curious. I I really was so inspired. And I guess um, they really are detached from outcomes and are very much in the present. So if something sparks their interest, they will stop and make time to really fully immerse themselves. And that's really not something that you can read in the books or see in Dan Butner's latest Netflix documentary that kind of really connecting with people on the ground who were so responsive and so curious, no matter what age. And I guess it's that zest for living and learning about other people and other cultures is what really stood out for me when I went to Okinawa, which is quite different from other Japanese um, who I'd met in other parts of Japan. 
And um, and then Loma Linda, um, similarly, very different, obviously, culturally. Like it was an American city that's only an hour away from Los Angeles, but small population, about 30,000 people, seven-day Adventist. So there's about 30 different churches there, even though it's such a small population. So very spiritual and um and I guess similarly, they have a higher life expectancy than the rest of the US. So people live 10 years longer than the average American, which is quite amazing. And you can attribute that to a combination of the spirituality and also, I guess, the lifestyle that comes with being seven day Adventist. And it's the idea of contributing to your community and and I guess similar to in Japan like very community focused and not necessarily focusing just on your own needs but really being aware of how do you fit in with the rest of your neighbors and your community and the people at work and really thinking much bigger picture and connecting with that bigger purpose and similarly being curious and wanting to actively put in those routines and activities that enable you to meet new people constantly. So that, that's a really important factor. As we get older, our social circles shrink and the opportunity to meet new people. Sometimes attitudinally people think, oh, well, I've got enough friends. I don't have enough time to see, make new friends, but actually what we see in longevity research is that it's so important to have those social connections, good quality ones, but then also being inspired by new people because they bring a different dimension. We can learn from people who are different from us, who are different, a different generation, um, older and younger. And that's the beauty of these communities that they are very intergenerational. Yeah. Um, Nat, can you describe how individuals plan for a longer life and career in your experience, some real life examples and practical tips on perhaps how you support people in your practice um, more recently? I think you mentioned you use um, design thinking um, to help them and, and visionary boards and things like that. Can you give us an idea about how we might go about our own planning? Yeah, um, so I guess it's there's a foundation that I've built based on all the research I've done and my programs are built off this five key ingredients of full-time living. So having a sense of purpose and connections and vitality as we've spoken about, lifelong learning and wealth and bringing all that together to have that healthy and meaningful and connected lifestyle and as we said earlier when we looked at the poll results it's really hard to do all of that all at the same time so I'm very mindful of that and I guess um, if we go to the next few slides about designing your long life and career I guess I use the design thinking framework to support people through I guess, their transition and how they can not just design it, but actually start to apply what they want to do to their lives one step at a time. So with design thinking, we always start off by looking at what are the unmet needs and really trying to do that discovery piece. So that's really helpful and just reimagining what our future can look like. So in my design thinking workshops where we use Lego serious play if we move to the next slide look it looks messy that is life <laughs> like, like basically everything's laid out in front of us but it's up to us to build things to reach out and grab what sparks our our joy as well as our curiosity in order to help us visualize our future so using creative serious play which is a strategic problem solving technique to get people to really connect with a different part of I guess how we can think bigger picture but it the key is actually having the right questions 
So for me, it's using these sorts of techniques that tap into our creativity and posing the right question, framing the question so that we can then come up with a vision for where we want to go in the distant future. So that's the first step. And then the next step is really to then connect with people around us. So whether they are people we already know, people who who know us really well and have seen us in lots of different scenarios, whether at work or our volunteering work that we might do or their friends from, you know, I guess some um, way back, there's the people who have our best interests in mind and they will see a different side to us and we're all multifaceted. The older we get, there's so many different things that I I guess make us unique. So having those people who inspire us and also we can learn from are really important in order to have a chat with them about an aspect of our vision and ask questions. So coming back to just being curious and asking questions, not of ourselves, but also of others and reflecting on what did they do that inspires the action that they took to get to where they are today? Because maybe the life that they're leading today that we really admire, they may not have been there. So it's just really trying to understand, well, what were the pivotal actions and moments that they took advantage of in order to get to where they are today and the way we see them today. So almost really doing that qualitative research yourself to go and talk to people, be curious, and also hear about the negative stories too. That was a big part of my quest in understanding longevity and healthy ageing, of understanding not just the positive practices and going on my quest around the world to visit, visit all different communities but also just understanding the pain points and the challenges to make sure that we are really clear about what are the pitfalls and risks that we need to be aware of so that we have that full picture. It's so linked to um, the reskilling and the and this and the reskilling uh, revolution uh, and the lifelong learning path that we need to carve out for ourselves isn't it absolutely and that's where the intergenerational part is really important to be able to hear from people who are a few steps ahead of us and then also learning from younger people because they have a very different perspective too like they're the ones who are leading a multi-stage life who are pausing reskilling, and regenerating their energy for well-being for the longer term. So younger people, millennials, are really good at that. That's something we can learn from them. Mm-hmm. Every generation brings something different to our lives and it's making sure we get those opportunities to get pe- get to know those people who are different from us and they feel comfortable to talk to us and share their personal learnings and experiences. Yeah, I often say to interim executives that I'm working with, you know, be curious about every person you meet and every discussion that you have. Because not only can it lead to a job (laughs) um, through your network, um, because the more you know someone and the more you understand them um, and what they do, I mean, it it can happen anywhere. Networking is not, you know, the traditional going into a ball with your cards at the ready it really is can happen everywhere and anywhere and it should and um it's lovely to hear their stories around you know what's come out of a discussion that they had no idea that it was going to lead to to work or a relationship or just send them down a pathway that they had they had no idea they were going on that journey you know it's it's curiosity is a big thing isn't it I agree. And that brings me to my next tip to yeah. explore your purpose with others, go yeah. on the journey with others. So since my book launch, I've been running monthly discussion circles for women and the women who show up are the ones who've read my book and are wanting to connect with others who are similarly on the journey to redefine their careers as well as what their identity looks like and their lifestyle and 
having that commonality with people who may be seeking different things, but the fact that they've shown up wanting to create change and connect with others who are on that path. And, you know, when I was doing customer research early days of full-time lives, one of the things that people often said to me is, Nat, if you could build something like Mother's Group, but for us later in life, because it's kind of similar in terms of we are going to this new stage in life that it's uncharted territory and you don't necessarily need to have exactly the same lived experience. And, you know, thinking about mother's groups, like we all have different experiences and different values as mothers, but it's that common experience, shared purpose of really trying to get through a challenging period, but then we all rise up if we support each other. Yeah, lovely. Other t- do you have other tips in that regard? Yeah, the next slide. Um, all about running short experiments. So this is another practice from design thinking. Design thinking doesn't assume that you have the right answer right away. It's actually going applying what you think might be what you want mm. or what might work. Having a hypothesis, then being quite scientific about the result and trying to break it down to very small bite-sized experiments that don't necessarily require too much resource, too much time, but you learn something about yourself. So running short experiments like deciding, well, if I want to take up a new purposeful project, maybe I won't necessarily resign from my job right away, but I'm just going to start somewhere, start small, test it out, see if I like it, maybe give myself the month of January when it's quiet to give it a go. If it doesn't work, that's okay. It Other things might surface. But just really being, giving yourself space in order to run these experiments, experiments and breaking down that bigger picture of what your big vision is so that you're doing it one step at a time. That's the key. What are you doing in that photo, by the way? Um, What's your trial? Um, <laughs> um, earlier this year, we uh, I'm part of the, the Silver Sirens community. and In fact, on Saturday, it's the Silver Sirens annual conference. So in this instance, um, we were, uh, I guess we were preparing for a photo shoot for the conference and um, <laughs> There was uh, one of the sponsors of the conference was giving out makeup to the women. <laughs> so oh, it was a funny moment. And I just thought kind of it's that I thought it was a great image in terms of everyone kind of being very focused in that moment Indeed. <laughs> and being um, playful. Excellent. Um, now, uh, should we move on to... Um, experience your experience with working with organizations um and how they are going to need to prioritize and adapt you know to the changing dynamics in a multi-generational workforce have you got some examples because i've got a question here from ada um it's great to have all the data and research of course but any thoughts on how to get or give incentives to companies and organizations to change the game yeah Gosh, if only there were incentives um, <laughs> from the government. Um, like so much work is needed in terms of making organisations change t- to build these multi-generational workforces. And if we can skip ahead to that slide. Um, I think look, in the absence of having government incentives, I guess the benefits far outweigh so having to implement change in order to allow for flexibility for different generations and no matter what stage of life is going to be really important to reap the benefits of having a multi-generational workforce so I guess the first step is really making it that a goal to start with and acknowledging there's a lot of value in a multi-generational workforce and then working with the culture that you have, the workforce that you have today, all its generations, 
to then co-design, well, what does that look like for where we are today as well as the future? So that whole design thinking approach is very much applicable, that same process of well, what questions are we trying to solve here? How are we going to frame it? What is important? What is our vision? And then being experimental in terms of working together and getting people involved, having those conversations internally, and then getting giving people the onus, the autonomy to be able to be part of pilot programs and co-design with them. That's going to be the key to bring it to life and not necessarily overthink the strategy, but bring the strategy to life bit by bit, step by step, through experiments and like being quite methodical in the learnings and using that scientific approach of having a hypothesis around each pilot experiment and then adapting it, not necessarily throwing it all out if something doesn't go according to plan, but actually taking those learnings and just refining it so that eventually you do have a strategy that works for the longer term. Mm. So, yeah, go on, Nat, sorry. So I guess um, having, I guess, different ways of thinking about what does the workforce community look like? And it's going beyond productivity in the traditional sense in terms of just jobs, but acknowledging that we're all humans and we all want social connections more than anything now, it, I know there's a lot of conversations now about people being forced to go back to the office well, that you're going showing up at the office is one way to try and bring connections. But I, I do feel that the pandemic has shown us that there are virtual ways of connecting people and having that higher purpose and being really clear about what is the mission of the organization in society and in communities and within the within the organization and having that clear purpose for people to connect with. So that there's that common bond and connection between employees and the wider community and the mission. And there's going to be lots. As I acknowledge, there's people at different stages of life that want something different. So enabling people to really understand what is that bigger vision and then coming, having that freedom and space to be able to do something that they are passionate about that lines up with that mission um, but that's actually having to let go of, I guess, the control, which maybe is culturally difficult for some organisations. So it's a real shift in the way leadership needs to be designed in order to bring enable people to bring their best selves, uh, no matter what stage in life, to then bring that purpose to each individual and team and it cross team sort of collaboration around being purposeful and using their best strengths and experiences. Yeah, I mean, one of the other key themes from our survey, of course, which is very aligned to that, is the want of meaningful work is become out on top. Um, when we surveyed our executive cohort, you know, that had become the number one uh, want and desire I want meaningful work I want to variety yes but I also want, I want to enjoy and appreciate and respect the leadership that I'm working with you know and the other it it all aligns doesn't it it's all interconnected um with what organizations need to to be thinking about now yeah um, how do you think we're going in Australia Natalie as compared to the rest of the world on this score I think we've got a way to go. There are some organisations that are doing really good work in terms of that inclusivity and recognition of the human who's coming to work every day and how they do want meaningful work. Mm. I've definitely had the privilege of working with organisations who I consult to who really recognise that when you give people space to be able to balance meaningful work at work for that company as well as meaningful work outside that that individual is going to thrive physically and mentally and give a lot more to their job so I think there's room for improvement in more organizations doing it 
but there's some examples of teams, I think, um, where the leaders are really recognize how to lead well and purposefully, and that has a whole flow and effect. And you have these highly productive charged teams who are not just giving back to their organizations, but to their clients and to the broader organization of colleagues outside of their teams and to their families as well, because they're able to thrive and not be drained by their work. In fact, they'll, they'll be enthusing, enthused by their work. Um, and it becomes it's a bit of a blur then, isn't it, between work and life and passion. And it all be, it's a great place to be to end up. Um, yeah. I've got a question from Kasturi. Um, is there, a, in your opinion, a conscious effort by the government to tap the skills from people with decades of experience, problem solving, crisis management, transformation? These, he believes these, or these real life experiences are more valuable than theory or bookish knowledge. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know that there's over the last few years has been a lot more discussion and recognition of ageism in the workforce. Mm. I just wish things could move faster. Um, I know that Kay Patterson had from the, um, the Age Discrimination um, Commissioner has done a lot of work in this space and is very much an advocate and I just wish more organisations were paying more serious attention to the fact that ageism is, is systemic in organisations. Unfortunately, it's the last remaining acceptable form of discrimination in the workplace. Mm, shocking. So um, I guess it's up to us as individuals to really see what we can do to advocate to show show and do and speak up mm. to take the lead and hopefully over time systemically and society at large will also change as a result absolutely um any other questions from the floor from the audience that you'd like natalie to address just checking the boxes here. Um, no, I can't see any. Natalie, any other, anything more to add before we close today? Um, I just think that it's a big topic and it's also really hard for people to imagine, I guess, several decades out. So without overwhelming people I think it's all about taking those steps for the shorter term and being really clear of where you want to go and making time and space whether it's a weekly or a monthly gathering with people to be able to move forward incrementally towards that because it gets easier and easier if you've built up those great routines as well as that ability to connect with people who are really supportive of your hopes and dreams for the life that you want to lead, where you're balancing out that well-being, the financial commitment uh, to be able to then thrive for much later in life, mm -hmm. uh, and then do meaningful meaningful work. And I think my experience and the people I've seen thrive uh, when they've been really committed to narrowing down on what is their purpose and being focused on that, life gets easier when you are a lot more focused on that one thing. And I've definitely found the case of me narrowing my focus to midlife women, doing consulting work that aligns and therefore all my other work, the volunteer work that I do is in support and it, it doesn't clash because I'm not having to context switch yeah. like I used to. Um, it, it is all very much, it inspires me. I learn from different spheres of the type of work I do and the different people I meet. And I feel like I, I'm continuing to grow and that's a lifelong learning of work and personal just all blends in and it all still connects to what I really care about. So I've that's probably been my biggest learning in this phase of my life of 
not trying to do too much. I lead a very active life. I, I, I'm involved in a lot of different things, but the overarching theme of it is connected to my purpose. Yeah. And that took me a long time to shape up and figure out what that yeah. was. Yeah, no, and, and you're, you, as you say, you don't have to second guess yourself in your decisions that you're making then. It all becomes very easy, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Natalie, could you quickly cover continuous improvement in your five-step process? I don't think oh. I think it's that. Yeah, so continuous improvement is all about um, build, test and learn. It's a really common thing that we do in design thinking that it doesn't just stop. It's not a stop and set and forget sort of process that you continue to refine what is your vision. You keep on revisiting, going back and having those conversations with people around you to then be clear about what are the next steps. So the multi-stage life concept of pausing in between big career and, I guess, projects that are quite significant and potentially draining pausing in order to rethink how am I going to reskill? How am I going to stay relevant? How am I going to make sure I look after my well-being and re-energize and restore? Where am I going? It that that's very much a practice that you need to apply. And I, I guess that's why I call it the art of full-time living. It's not something that you just do once. You have to keep doing and refining and see what works for you. And circumstances change. Your health changes. The people around you, their health changes as well. So we can't always pre preempt or predict what's going to happen in the world around us. And so being able to have that flexibility. So it's always good to have a plan, but also just kind of being able to adapt to what's ahead of us and what has landed on our feet so that we're still true to ourselves and the vision we're heading towards. But it's actually just being mindful of unexpected things and adapting what we need to do, you know, to still keep on that path of full-time living. Yeah. Um, and then final question, Natalie, I think for today, um, could you comment on what, organizations or sectors are doing this well yeah good question um it's probably less about the uh, sector um because you get a whole mix but i get to consult to different sectors and i'm i think it's more about specific pockets in organizations that are doing amazing work in making a difference for communities as well as their staff. So I'm um, currently doing some consulting to Care and Living with MESA. And I feel like this team that I'm working with are really getting it right because they're making a difference in offering their services to large organisations as super funds, financial advisors, and so, like, being very focused on the need where women are increasingly needing some advice and guidance, support to find the right in-home care for their ageing family members or changed living environments for their ageing caregivers, uh, sorry, for their, uh, I guess, older family members, but also starting to educate people and planning their own ageing journey. Mm -hmm. It's really quite innovative and I, I think that just seeing the way that they're navigating, bringing together a whole new different service but then having to also educate the market in yeah. how people need to be planning their lives as well as the lives of others, that's really great to see. So yeah. um, so I think it's just kind of where they have to wind you up. <laughs> Okay. I'm so sorry. We're going to come to an end. Ali, could you throw up the resources page for us um, as we come to the top of the hour? Um, there's so much to talk about, Natalie. Sorry for cutting you off there. Um, but everyone, thank you for attending. There is a list of resources. Um, please do follow up um, and start your future planning today. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks very much. See you on the next one. All the best. Bye now.